a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 and record your name as prompted. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn today's meeting over to Helen Tally McRae. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Tally McRae, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call on November 7th, 2018. Before we get started, please be aware that although the content of these calls is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Finally, today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Detailed instructions for obtaining free CE are available on our website and will be given at the end of this call. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses, partners, wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products suppliers of commercial services or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there's no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Please spread the word to your colleagues about the Zohu call and this new free e opportunity. Before we begin today's presentation, CDC's One Health Office Director, Dr. Kate C. Barton Baravesh, will share some One Health news updates with you. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and welcome to all of our new participants. We really appreciate you all for helping us to spread the word about the Zohu call and letting your colleagues know that we now offer free continuing education. Please continue sharing information about the Zohu call. Our call audience is really growing, and we now have over 9,150 subscribers representing professionals from government, non-governmental organizations, industry, academia, and even students and other partners. So we're very excited to have, have this call. To begin, I'd like to share the latest One Health news and resources with you. These links are included in today's Zohu Call email reminder. One Health Day was November 3rd, and in recognition of this day, I'll be giving a presentation shortly on today's call. Also in recognition of U.S. Antibiotics Awareness Week, we'll have a presentation about the AMR Challenge. CDC recently published 2016 reports about healthcare-associated infections and foodborne disease outbreaks, and ASPR published the United States Health Security National Action Plan. Two events of interest are happening next week. First is the APHA conference in San Diego, and the second is I'll be giving a presentation on One Health in Action at the CDC to the One Health Academy in Washington, D.C. on the night of November 14th. In the Zohu Call News, we've also shared some recent publications, including an investigation in response to a hepatitis A outbreak from imported scallops, phenotypic switching in newly emerged multi-drug resistant pathogen Candida auris, evidence of likely transmission of Chagas disease in Arizona, new tools in the Ebola arsenal, and surveillance for Salmonella enterica serotype Newport, as well as several others. Highlighted MMWR topics include influenza A variant virus outbreak at three fairs, the translocation of a stray cat infected with rabies, West Nile and other nationally notifiable arboviral diseases, 
the re recurrence of a multi-state outbreak of salmonella enteritis infections linked to contact with guinea pigs, as well as a notes from the field on carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates colonizing residents at a skilled nursing facility. There are multiple outbreaks under investigation, including two new outbreaks of salmonella infections linked to ground beef and raw chicken, and a new listeria outbreak linked to deli ham. There are also several ongoing outbreaks available on the web and the final update of an outbreak of salmonella infections linked to shell eggs. As always, there's a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals, available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. If you'd like for us to share news from your organization or if you want to suggest presentation topics or volunteer to present on a future Zohu call, please contact us. And thanks again for supporting the call and for joining us today. Back over to you, Helen. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Martin Barovich. Today's presentations address one or more of the following learning objectives. Describe two key points for each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topic. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. Identify two new resources from CDC partners. Today's presentation topics are One Health in Action at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Protecting Health in the United States and Around the World. Excellence in Exhibition, Preventing Zoonoses Among Youth in Agriculture, and the AMR Challenge. You'll find resources and links for each presentation in today's Zoho Call re reminder email and on our website. Questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of this call. Call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. Okay, our first presentation is also by Dr. Casey Martin Barabesh, One Health in Action at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Protecting Health in the United States and Around the World. Over to you, Dr. Martin Barabesh. Thanks, Helen. I'm excited to be presenting an update on our One Health work at CDC on today's Zohu call. And this call has been submitted as a One Health Day event based on participants' suggestions to share some updates on CDC's One Health work. We wanted to take the opportunity to give this presentation today. So please keep those suggestions for call topics coming. To begin with, I want to highlight that the health of humans is connected to the health of animals and the environment. Whether it's our connection for food and fiber, including global livelihoods, also for companionship, sport, entertainment, and travel, as well as pets and companionship and the importance of animals in our lives. One Health is all about people who protect the health of humans, animals, and the environment, as well as other partners who work together, coordinating, communicating, and collaborating to achieve the best health outcomes for people, animals, plants, and our environment. One Health has really been gaining a lot of global momentum in recent years, and the definition and descriptions of One Health have advanced and have been updated. This is actually the U.S. government definition for One Health. One Health is a collaborative effort of multiple disciplines and sectors with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. And this applies locally, nationally, regionally, and globally. And because of the growing interest in One Health, it's extremely important that we're all using consistent language and information when we're talking about One Health. So we encourage you to use this definition and share it widely with your partners to help make sure we're all speaking the same language. One Health is a team sport and partnerships are key. There's a myth out there that only veterinarians work in One Health. There are many others that do so, including physicians, ecologists, epidemiologists, scientists, laboratorians, social scientists, and many, many other disciplines. 
There are also a number of partners involved in One Health, whether they're from government, non-governmental organizations, academia, industry, and many more. So again, it's important. No one person or sector can do this work alone. One Health is a team sport, and partnerships are key. There's also a myth that One Health is just about zoonotic diseases. Here's some examples of topics on One Health in action across CDC. Zoonotic diseases and emerging infectious diseases are important ones, things like antimicrobial resistance and food safety and influenza and, and other issues. But there's a lot more to One Health than zoonotic diseases. Things like pandemic preparedness, environmental health, surveillance, lab animal medicine, occupational health. We've even had some One Health work around obesity and the opioid crisis and, and mental health and beyond. So now I want to go into what the CDC One Health office is, is focusing on. CDC's had a One Health office in place since 2009 and we've really grown over time, and our big focus areas right now include zoonotic and emerging infectious diseases, global health security, influenza and pandemic preparedness, advancing One Health in the United States and globally, supporting One Health issues and emergencies at the human-animal environment interface, and also preventing zoonoses shared between people and pets. And under all of these, promoting One Health through communications and partnerships. So despite One Health not focusing on zoonotic diseases, in the short amount of time I have here, I'm going to give some highlights on zoonoses. So we know that 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic, meaning that they're shared between animals and people. At least 70% of emerging infectious diseases in people have an animal origin, and 80% of agents with potential bioterrorist use are zoonotic pathogens, making them a very important One Health issue. So some highlights from CDC's One Health work in the United States includes that we are working very hard to advance and strengthen One Health in our country. We've recently, in partnership with the Department of Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, have prioritized zoonoses at a national level using a One Health approach. We have eight priority zoonotic diseases. This topic has been discussed in detail on a earlier ZOHU call, and we'll have a report available in the very near future, and we'll be sure to share that with all of you. As part of the follow-on activities for this workshop in the United States, we're working to develop a national One Health framework that will um, allow all of the partners to work together more effectively on some focused One Health priorities. Also, we're coordinating a One Health federal interagency network as a platform to bring together federal partners to share updates and information on their One Health work and network on areas where we might be able to collaborate. We're also partnering with key state and federal organizations. We support the Youth and Agriculture Project. You're going to hear a great example um, on this important project from our next presenter shortly. We also coordinate some of CDC's unique partnerships with veterinary and animal health and environmental groups and other partners. We distribute education on zoonoses and One Health topics to our stakeholders, such as through the ZOHU call, as well as websites, other social media, and other communication messages. Globally, we provide technical assistance on zoonoses and One Health, and we're doing this to just over 20 countries. We partner with key global organizations like the World Health Organization and the U.S. Agency for International Development, and we actually host CDC loaned experts, our One Health liaisons, to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, as well as the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE. We serve as the head of an OIE collaborating center for emerging and re-emerging zoonotic diseases. We support global health security activities and lead CDC's One Health zoonotic disease prioritization process. We've done this process now in 20 countries around the world, and I just wanted to take a moment to point out our website and highlight a common question we get about this process, or what are the zoonotic diseases of, of highest concern around the world? And those are listed here from these workshop outcomes. Rabies, zoonotic influenza viruses, viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, Marburg, Rift Valley fever, and others, anthrax, and brucellosis. You can learn more about this from our website. I also want to highlight that zoonotic outbreaks are being recognized more frequently in the United States 
One of the challenges around that is animals can often appear healthy and clean, but still be carrying pathogens that can make people sick. We've seen new and surprising things like soul virus show up in pet rats, uh, an older strain of a bird flu show up in cats in an animal shelter, LCMV showing up in pet mice and hamsters, multi-drug resistant Campylobacter showing up in puppies, Salmonella and E. coli showing up in a variety of animals, and um, who knows what will happen next. So as, as part of our work to address these concerns and filling a national void and preventing zoonoses shared between people and pets, we work to provide human-animal environment interface support during outbreaks and emergencies involving pets and other animals when requested. We partner with the pet industry, professional organizations, and others to to strengthen our partnerships around preventing zoonoses linked to these animals. We work closely with the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and, and many other partners on this issue. We work to prevent zoonoses through evidence-based activities. We're proud to support NASPHB's work on developing compendia and guidance around a variety of zoonotic disease topics, things like rabies and psittacosis and animals in public settings and others, and also through the Zoonoses Education Coalition where we work to have partners sharing the best, uh, most up-to-date evidence-based messaging around zoonotic diseases. And we also distribute information on zoonoses prevention through our Healthy Pets, Healthy People website which is a great resource on preventing zoonoses, not only linked to pets, but also livestock and wildlife. And we have a lot of great information on there about enjoying interacting with animals, whether you have them at home or away from home, and how to reduce your risk of illness and injury. So I want to say that One Health is the way forward to best protect health for all of us. The effective mitigation of the impact of these shared health threats can be complex at the human-animal environment interface, and they require strong One Health collaboration and partnership. By using a One Health approach, it allows us to have the biggest possible impact on improving health outcomes for both people and animals in our shared environment. You can learn more about our One Health work in the United States and around the world on our website and through our fact sheet. And I thank you for your time and attention. I'll answer questions at the end of the call. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Barton Barabesh. Our next presentation, Excellence in Exhibition, Preventing Zoonoses Among Youth in Animal Agriculture, will be given by Dr. Abby Cannon. Dr. Cannon, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. Uh, good afternoon. Today I am going to give you a brief introduction to some resources that we've developed at the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University in conjunction with the Iowa Department of Public Health to prevent zoonotic diseases among youth involved in animal agriculture. We hope to teach youth in a fun way tools they can bring home, uh, use to bring home the blue and not the flu. H3N2 is a strain of influenza A that com commonly circulates among swine and can infect humans. These viruses are called variant viruses when they infect people, and the letter V is attached to the influenza strain name, for example, H3N2V. We saw sporadic cases of H3N2V influenza in humans during 2011, but during 2012, there were multiple outbreaks of H3N2V with 309 cases. Because these H3N2V outbreaks occurred primarily in children with close contact and prolonged exposure to swine at agricultural fairs, many of whom were exhibitors, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists funded a pilot project to develop influenza prevention education as well as awareness and education about other zoonotic diseases among these youth. The project was also intended to foster collaboration and partnership between animal health, human health, and state and county youth agriculture organizations. As in many of our states, agriculture is a key part of life in Iowa. Youth agriculture programs, such as 4-H and FFA, are a key element in the future of animal husbandry and food production. In our state, we have approximately 100,000 youth involved in 4-H, 
and about 15,000 youth in FFA. Nationally, there are 6 million active 4-H members and more than 650,000 FFA members. Most youth that are interested in some type of agriculture career are involved in 4-H, FFA, or both. Animal agriculture projects teach youth responsibility and sportsmanship, build confidence, and offer an opportunity for our youth to educate the public about agriculture and where our food comes from. Youth animal agriculture projects are generally reared on a smaller scale and involve closer contact with animals. As a result, disease transmission risks exist. In looking at where our gaps were for disease control and prevention, biosecurity was being addressed much more in our commercial farms, but not as much on a smaller scale, particularly for youth agriculture projects. While programs addressing food safety are currently available for youth in agriculture, programs addressing biosecurity, animal health, and zoonotic disease risks were limited. From those considerations, and with the support of CDC, CSTE, and the Iowa Department of Public Health, we developed an online course, Excellence in Exhibition, Preventing Disease in Animals and People, available at www.bluenotflu.org. It is free, accessible for all types of learners, responsive on tablets and phones and any electronic devices, and available to anyone with an internet connection. The course, which includes six lessons designed to be completed in 20 to 30 minutes each, may be taken independently by anyone at any time, but is targeted at middle to high school aged youth. The first three lessons cover specific zoonotic diseases, such as influenza, and ways to prevent transmission to humans and among animals. The remaining lessons review case studies, agencies, and career opportunities in One Health. A new course, still focusing on biosecurity and zoonotic disease prevention, but targeted at elementary aged youth, was just published at the same website um, just a couple of days ago. The courses were both developed with many partners to ensure positive messaging. They have achieved national 4-H peer review status, ensuring that the courses maintain standards of quality, credibility, and integrity of 4-H curriculum. They are designed to encourage youth involvement with livestock and animal exhibitions in a safe and healthy manner while preventing zoonotic diseases, following biosecurity recommendations, and promoting public and animal health. One of the main reasons why these online courses are so exciting is because we were able to use numerous interactive elements and gamification. We've used various kinds of games, many of which most users would be familiar with, to reinforce key concepts. We often receive feedback about games being the most liked part of the online courses. A certificate is available at the end of each lesson, as well as a final certificate at the end of the course. Users can personalize their certificates with their name, club or chapter, and their county. The certificates also include an element of achievement. Students can earn badges after each lesson that will show up on their certificate. Each lesson can be taken independently, but users will only achieve the badge for that lesson once completed. On the same website, we also have free supplemental resources, including learning objectives with answers in a password-protected area for instructors to incorporate into their classrooms, PowerPoint slides containing the same information as the online courses, disease fact sheets, lesson worksheets, and hands-on activity guides developed by the Center for Food Security and Public Health, as well as other states involved in this youth and agriculture project. The hands-on activities described have been used in combination with the online courses and in-person PowerPoint presentations. For example, we have held workshops at State 4-H events where we required participants to complete the online course before participation in the workshop and then provide proof of completion with a certificate. The activities are used and essential to reinforce lessons learned about biosecurity, disease transmission, and prevention. Knowing that students have a base knowledge of zoonosis prevention lets us be more interactive and role play in disease investigation scenarios during workshops.
The Blue Knot Flu website has been visited more than 6,400 times since its launch last year. We've had about 1,700 people from 43 states, as shown in the map, actually click the button to take the course. We've had close to 450 middle to high school aged youth participate in various workshops around the state. Following completion of the course, we have an optional online evaluation that we developed with CDC and CSC. Despite not having high response numbers to the evaluation, the data that we do have suggests that the course is effective. We ask users about their behavior, such as washing their hands, eating in animal areas, and sharing equipment before and after taking the course. Each measure shows improvement with most responses indicating desired intention to change behavior. The free online courses can be used in a variety of ways by anyone, anywhere. Local or state animal health associations, county fair boards, or other exhibition organizers can require exhibitors to complete the course before showing. Agriculture or science teachers can easily incorporate lessons and learning objectives into their classrooms. Youth can use the courses in preparation for FFA career development events, animal science skill or other contests. 4-H clubs or FFA chapters can have local competitions for most certificates achieved by members, or counties or states could use these courses as part of animal or veterinary science award requirements. The partnership of animal and public health with youth organizations is essential to reach youth, their parents, and other adult volunteers or youth specialists. Regarding considerations about zoonotic disease and biosecurity, the partnership through this project has significantly impacted and changed the direction of youth animal science programs in Iowa. Supported by these partnerships, web-based education, especially when supplemented with hands-on activities, presents an opportunity to promote youth involvement in animal agriculture, increase disease prevention practices, and reduce zoonotic disease risks. Requiring completion of these courses prior to showing animals may increase disease prevention behaviors and further reduce zoonotic disease risk. I encourage you all to visit bluenotflu.org and explore the resources available. Please don't hesitate to reach out anytime if we can help you use any of the material or if you would like the password for the instructor area of the website. And I'd be happy to take questions after the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Cannon. Our final presentation the AMR challenge is by Mr. Michael Craig. Mr. Craig, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. And good afternoon to everyone. This is Michael Craig. I'm Senior Advisor for AR Coordination and Strategy at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. And for today's agenda, I wanted to give you a little background on the problem of antibiotic resistance, an overview of the AMR challenge, and examples of high impact commitments, ways that you potentially can participate, and then have Q&A along with the other speakers uh, on the call today. <clears throat> I want to highlight this, uh, the AMR challenge specifically, because it is something that is critical to uh, combating antibiotic resistance, and it's a new initiative that CDC is launching, and we are taking a One Health approach uh, to the problem of AMR through this challenge. Quick background on antibiotic resistance. So antibiotic resistance is one of the most urgent threats to public health uh, in the United States as well as globally that we face. It threatens our progress uh, around the world in healthcare, food production, and life expectancy. Antibiotic resistance ultimately occurs when germs defeat the drugs that are designed to kill them. And as folks have probably know from our AR threat report, which you can see in the picture here, um, in the U.S. alone, it affects over 2 million people, and at least 23,000 die from a resistant germ. AR has been found in all regions of the world, uh, and the global burden is really unknown. Progress has been made to date, uh, but much more action is needed to move the needle, which is partly why we have been sponsoring and our, our, have this new initiative called the AMR Challenge. 
As I noted at the top of the presentation, antibiotic resistance, like a lot of the, the issues that Casey described earlier, are really um, One Health focused. That is, the challenges of resistance can be found in uh, animal veterinary sectors, the environment, as well as in human health care. Uh, through this Venn diagram that you can see here, there are um, challenges with resistance that are known um, and, uh, and impact those other sectors. So for example, in the environment, resistance can be found in water and soil. Uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a common fung uh, fungus that's found in agriculture, has been found in three states carrying resistance to antifungal drugs that are important to human health. And in fact, CDC just released information about uh, human cases that appear to be related to environmental exposures, um, and those cases were drug-resistant forms of Aspergillus fumigatus. In human health, of course, resistant infections can be deadly, and those resistant germs can grow in sink drains and potentially spread to the healthcare environment, and also through water systems, through hospital effluent and other sources, and potentially uh, be a reservoir and contaminate the environment. Resistant germs, all, of course, can make humans and animals sick. As Casey noted, um, we are dealing with uh, and have been dealing with a multi-state outbreak of resistant Campylobacter that has made people and puppies sick. Um, and it's a, a once more a great iteration of how human health and animal health are directly related to one another. So the AMR challenge, uh, to address the growing problem of AR, CDC came up with the idea of the AMR challenge, and we, are, uh, we at CDC are spearheading this effort. It is a year-long initiative to really engage stakeholders and partners from around the world and really challenge them to make commitments, step up, partner, and play their part in the fight against AMR. We did a similar type of uh, commitment activity with uh, the 2015 White House Antibiotic Stewardship Forum, which was an extremely successful engagement that was focused more domestically on improving antibiotic stewardship in the United States. For the AMR challenge, we're broadening that. And with the One Health focus, we are trying to engage uh, global stakeholders. So the, the emphasis is that we are trying to really engage stakeholders, and we mean that in the, in the broadest sense of the term. We're engaging countries at a diplomatic level. We're engaging clinical societies, companies, uh, states, really anyone and everyone under the sun to make a commitment for the challenge. And we have five commitment areas, and I would just note to you that for all these five commitment areas, all of them have a One Health focus. So we're trying to get commitments in these five areas because we, re we believe they represent the five areas that are needed to uh, comprehensively address AMR globally. So those five commitment areas are tracking and data, infection prevention and control, uh, antibiotic use, environment and sanitation, and vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. <clears throat> and it's important that we would want to note here is that um, we're challenging folks to make a commitment uh, through this challenge year. It, we, kicked this off, we kicked the AMR challenge off in September of 2018, um, and it's going to run through September of 2019. <clears throat> As you can see here, when we launched the event, we launched it at the UN General Assembly in, on September 25th. Secretary Alex Azar uh, kicked this off. And we had engaged with stakeholders prior to the launch so that we had, um, at the time of the launch in September, 99 commitments from more than 100 organizations. And I will say we've already been adding to that and we continue to add to that number daily. We're, um, it's been a little over a month since the, the launch event and we're already up to 130 commitments. Some examples of those commitments are, and sort of the One Health nature of them, the AMR Industry Alliance, um, which is a, a collection of the pharmaceutical manufacturers of antibiotics, they publish new discharge targets to guide environmental risk assessments for antibiotic manufacturing, which is essentially coming up with um, scientifically derived guidelines for how much antibiotic effluent can come out of their factories. It was the first time that has been done, and they took a, a, an important scientific approach that was grounded in the scientific literature. Walmart 
is working with animal protein suppliers to report and improve antibiotic use through its supply chain, and it's actually using blockchain technology. And this has implications across um, 5,000 plus stores in the Walmart network. CARVX is investing $80 million this year to support 40 plus drug diagnostic and vaccine developers um, to make innovations in the antibiotic resistant space. And a number of healthcare systems which impact care at 20,000 plus facilities in the U.S. and abroad made commitments specifically to reducing uh, infections across their healthcare systems. I would want to, I, I do want to note here that we are seeking commitments between September 2018 and September 2019 through this challenge year, but it doesn't mean that the commitment needs to be completed by September 2019. We're using this challenge year to really bring the commitments in. Uh, for many organizations, they have commitments that actually go beyond this year and, and go into subsequent years and, and are sort of planning on building on the work that they've the, the work that they've already committed to or um, growing into new new areas that they haven't uh, yet approached. So I want to encourage all of you, if you're part of an organization <laughs> and you want to make a commitment, that you can commit to action. This is open to anyone and everyone. Email arx at cdc.gov to learn more. We have templates uh, for making commitments that we can share with you. What we're doing with all the commitments are we are promoting them on the CDC website, and you can actually see the plain language summaries from the organizations that have already made commitments and that we're promoting at www.cdc.gov backslash drug resistance. In addition, we're going to be promoting these on social media and through other uh, means with the idea to really highlight leadership in this space, to bring in additional commitments, and to challenge really others to spread the word about AMR and to step up and make commitments themselves. And with that, I will end and uh, see if there are questions and turn the call over to Helen. If you want more information about the um, AMR challenge, again, email arx at cdc.gov. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Mr. Craig. Uh, at this time, we'd like to take questions from any of our for any of our presenters. Um, if you haven't already called in, if you'd like to ask a question, you'll need to call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of your question. Carolyn, do we have any questions? And I'm currently showing no questions or comments. Again, as a reminder, if you have a question or a comment, please press star 1. Make sure your phone is unmuted and record your name as prompted. And you may press star 2 to withdraw that request. Again, for questions or comments from the phones, please press star 1 at this time. And we'll stand by for questions or comments. And again, for questions or comments, it is star one and record your name. One moment, please. And we do have a question or comment coming from Vivian Leung. And please state your affiliation. Hi, I'm with the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Hey, who is your question for, please? Uh, Craig. I'm sorry, the, the most recent speaker? Michael Craig, okay, go ahead. Michael Craig. Um, uh, I would like to ask if um, CDC is working directly with EPIC, the EMR system, in regards to um, steps that they can take as part of this AMR challenge, and what are the steps that EPIC uh, has committed to? So thanks for reaching out and um, we have been reaching out to all sectors, and I will say the EHR vendor group has been one that we have reached out to, and in fact, we uh, engaged them earlier this year at the uh, APIC conference and had some conversations with them specifically about uh, the National Healthcare Safety Network. Um, a lot of them are interested in some of the antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance reporting through NHSN. Um, I, I can double check. I'm not sure if we have a commitment yet to date from EPIC. 
Um, but a lot of the conversations we've sort of started and then we're following up with organizations about their commitments if they haven't made one. Welcome to hear thoughts from you, though, if there are things specifically that you would like to see organizations like EPIC make. Um, it's always helpful for us to hear from state health department partners. Am I, am I still on the line? You are. Oh, okay. Um, actually, yes, this morning we had a stakeholder meeting with a lot of healthcare uh, providers in our state and uh, hospital epidemiologists. And um, in terms of MDROs, um, is they would love to, they've been trying to work with EPIC on flagging patients with MDROs or having automated um, systems to prevent unnecessary antimicrobial uh, prescriptions, for example. Okay, so it's, it's knowing if someone is colonized or infected with uh, an MDRO pathogen when they're in the healthcare facility and, and so that it can sort of spur the right response, whether that's, you know, the, the appropriate prescribing or the imp appropriate infection control procedures? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think I will say in, in terms of the conversations we've had with the EHR vendors, there's been a lot of discussion around those type of areas. Of course, it's it is sometimes a little challenging because each of the, the vendors have proprietary software and they have proprietary ways that they approach the problem. But I think, you know, what you're talking about is very much something that uh, we agree. We'd like to see some progress with more, and we know that EHR vendors are extremely influential and, and can play a, a critical role here. So I think, you know, I again, I can't comment specifically about what where EPIC is in terms of making commitment or what it would look like, but I will say all of the things that you're raising are very much akin to sort of the commitments that we're engaging EHR vendors about. Thank you. Thank you, and again, as a reminder, for a question or a comment from the phones, it is star one. Make sure your phone is unmuted and record your name, and it is star two to withdraw that request. We do have a question or comment coming from Allison, and please state your affiliation. Hi, this is Allison from CDC in Fort Collins, Colorado. My question is for Casey Barton Barabesh. Great. Hi, Allison. Hi, Casey. I'm just curious from something you said in your talk uh, as to how an opioid investigation has benefited from a One Health approach. Well, not a specific investigation, but the, the issue around opioid abuse isn't just something that involves the human health sector. There are components where veterinarians prescribe opioids as well for animal patients, and there have been some issues where people are taking advantage of animals and even some animal abuse issues where people have been using that as a way to get the drugs prescribed for animals that people can then use themselves or distribute in other ways. So it's a, it's a big issue that requires One Health discussions. Oh, great. Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And again, as a reminder, for questions or comments from the phones, it's star one. Make sure your phone is unmuted and record your name. And it is star two to withdraw that request. Again, for further questions or comments at this time, please press star one. And I'll stand by for further questions or comments. And again, for questions or comments, it is star one, and it is star two to withdraw that request. And we'll stand by for questions or comments. And I am currently showing no further questions or comments at this time. Okay, great, Carolyn, thanks so much. We're, um, looks like we might be uh, finishing up sooner than we usually do, but um, we really uh, appreciate today's speakers and um, for their excellent presentation. want to thank all of them and thank everyone for participating. Um, instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is 1Health2018. 
to receive free CE for today's webcast, WC2962-110718, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by December 10th, 2018. A recording of today's call will, will be posted online by December 10th, 2018 at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu2018 november.html. To receive free CE credits for the web on demand, WD2962-110718, video of today's call, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by December 11, 2020. Thanks again for your participation. Our next call will be taking place on Wednesday, December the 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Please send your suggestions and questions to zohucall at cdc.gov. For more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu. This ends our call today. Thank you. That concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.